Good morning and welcome to worship. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning and we welcome our new accompanist. Beautiful job as you welcomed us into worship. Next Sunday is Rally Sunday on August 25th. We will be beginning our new Sunday school year and then classes will officially start on September the 8th. Today at 4 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, we have a Faith Formation Leadership Gathering. You should have received an email if you're in that group, but this would include all Sunday school leaders, Bible study leaders, God parents, UMYF. If you lead in some way a small group that helps with Faith Formation, we hope you'll come at 4 o'clock. And then from 5 until 7-ish, Today, we have a pizza and movie night. So we'll be making homemade miniature pizzas and watching a movie as we kick off this new school year. This is for all ages, so you are all invited tonight. If you don't have a dinner plan, come and join us, make a homemade pizza, enjoy watching a movie as we fellowship as an intergenerational group. Our next Front Porch Faith will be on Thursday, August 29th at 7 o'clock at the home of Robert and Jolene Perry. And as a side note, Robert is in Colorado this week doing some continuing ed coursework. So we wish him well as he studies and learns. I invite Wes forward for an announcement. Good morning. Um, Just wanted to remind you that our back to school sacred space prayer experience is still um, set up in the parlor for you today. So whether you can do that after worship today or um, tonight when you come back for a movie night, it'll be available to you. Um, You can uh, go through and just look and see what's in there or you can stay and prayer one or 12 of the stations, whatever uh, works for you. So we'd invite you to experience that. Also, uh, this Wednesday, the 21st, our adult choir and bell programs will begin again. So um, if you are interested in singing or ringing, please let me know. And even if you're not available the entirety of the year, maybe you can come for a few months or so, that's fine. Just let me know and we'll get you going. So um, choir starts at 6.30 p.m. and bells is at 7.15. Thank you. In addition to that, our new Wednesday ministries begin on September the 4th. There will be something for all ages beginning after school for children. There will be music and faith formation groups. There will be a midweek meal, if that's of interest to you, and a midweek shorter worship time. So we hope you might make note of the email you were sent this week. Read it, please. See what's going on on Wednesdays this year and decide what part you might like to take. This week, we also received an email from Camp Fontenelle. They have already raised $1.7 million. (coughs) Y'all, that is wonderful. And they're going to begin the new retreat center at Camp Fontenelle this coming fall. They are still looking to raise another $700,000 to reach their total goal in the next year. So if you've not given yet, and camping ministry has been placed on your heart, I encourage you to look at the Camp Fontenelle website and consider how you might be a part of that. At this time, I invite you to stand. Please greet one another in Christian love and in fellowship with a warm hello. Is there anyone here from the Wild Goose Worship Group? I see that has something to do with our call to worship this morning. Pardon? Oh, she said that's who wrote it. Okay, good. Please join me. Christ's food in our souls. 
of who we share life with. Christ's life in our hands, our lives shaped by his. Christ's love in our hearts, our love born through his. Christ's peace on our earth, path, excuse me, that follows his. Amen. All right, our psalm today is Psalm 80. You can follow along on the screen or in your hymnal on page 801. shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth in the presence of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. You, you brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. He set out the branches to the sea, and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down, may they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name.
quietness of this place, we hush the noisiness of our lives. We set aside the frenzy of our schedules to acknowledge that you are still our God, rather than to manufacture the importance of our activities. Here, in this room, we reposition our priorities. How good it is to be still, to let the music and the words create peaceful places in our souls. How reassuring are the scriptures that reconnect us to a life that endures forever. How inspiring it is to worship with friends and family. How that strengthens our commitment. Amen. At this time, we invite the children forward for a children's time. <coughs> Morning. How are you guys? Good. Hey, fellas. How are you guys today? Has it been a good start to school? So far, just a few days. Well, today we're going to be talking about how God is our anchor, how Jesus is our anchor. And behind us, you'll see the backdrop that we worked on during Arts Week, and you'll see we've got some ships sailing in, and we've tied the anchor to this boat. I want you to think about this anchor. It looks kind of heavy. How far do you think this boat could get from the anchor? What do you think? Could it get over by you, Gavin? Would it still reach? Could it go all the way to the back? Would it reach back there? No, it wouldn't, would it? It'll only go as far as the rope or the chain is. An anchor holds the boat in a certain area, doesn't it? Kind of in a circular area. So if we think of Jesus like the anchor and we're the boat, how far away from Jesus do we want to get? Not that far, do we? Well, in our scripture, and we read this same scripture last week, we're reading it for three weeks in a row, so we really get it in our head. From Hebrews 6, verse 19, it says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And it reminds us that our anchor is Jesus. He is firm and secure. And we want to stay not that far, don't we? It's a good reminder as we enter into this new school year. Let's pray together. Dear sweet Jesus, we thank you that you are the anchor to our soul. You are firm and secure. Help us, Lord, to remember not to wander far, but to stay near you, to grow in your love and in your grace for each of us. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our hope and our assurance of things now and to come. Lord, we continue to pray a blessing over the people gathered in this room. Might they be your light to the world and your hope that they share with other people. For it's in your name we pray and we say together, amen.
We will say a prayer together and then our acolytes will come around and we invite you to lift your joys and concerns before the church body that we might also pray with you in the coming week. Will you pray? Dear sweet Jesus, we just thank you that you are our hope. As the song we just sang says, all we want is you. Lord, help that to be our hope and our desire as we pray together today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. The acolytes will come around, and if you'd raise your hand, they will invite you to share your joys and concerns that we might pray with you. I am asking that our church family lift up Marla and Ray Isha. Ray has been in the hospital in Lincoln for five days. He is recovering from surgeries to remove an infection, and I would ask prayers for healing. As we pray together, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Virginia Cattle asked me to ask you for prayers for Ruth Downing, who took a fall. Uh, nothing broken, but she's quite sore and, and back home. In your mercy, Lord, for prayers of healing, hear our prayer. This is for a thank and a, and a celebration. If you have not been to the parlor, please stop in, look around, and maybe even stop at one of the stations. It's, it's beautiful. It's a work of art, and I applaud the people who put it together. Thank you so very much. For the opportunity to pray together, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, we just pray that in this stillness, let us hear, let us listen, let us gather together with you in our soul and in our mind and in our heart. Lord, as you have taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise for the scripture lessons. The author of Hebrews, or authors as it might be, are not known. It was apparently written by an early Christian or Christians to Jews who were considering accepting Jesus as the Messiah. We have quotes today from chapter 6, 11, and 12 about the certainty of God's promise. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Human beings, of course, swear by someone greater than themselves, and an oath given as confirmation puts an end to all dispute. In the same way, when God desired to show even more clearly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it by an oath so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible that God would prove false, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest of ever, forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, 
did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, without us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Did you hear that in the text? It said they didn't get what they had asked for. God gave them something better. I heard it differently. Thank you, Cliff. Let us pray. Dear sweet Jesus, we just thank you that you don't always give us what we ask for. You give us something better. Lord, we thank you that in our scripture today we hear of people of faith. We thank you that you have called us to be people of faith, to be anchored to you. Lord, in the coming week, might the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be pleasing in your sight. It's in your name we pray and say together. Amen. So anchored. It's a nautical metaphor that has been used often, and it calls us to remember our seafaring days. So what is an anchor? Well, a quick Google search brought me to Wikipedia, and it gave me a lot of other sites where I could have gained some information. In essence, an anchor is usually made of metal, and it is used to connect a vessel to a bed of a body of water to prevent drifting due to the wind or the current. Now, anchors can be temporary or they can be permanent. An anchor achieves the holding power by literally hooking itself into the seabed or by sheer mass or sometimes a combination of the two. An anchor is attached to a vessel by a cable made of rope or chain. Anchors come in so many shapes and sizes and forms, you could look at hundreds of pictures of them. Anchors have a long history, yet we still use them today. Christian men, missionaries often wear a cross anchor around their neck to symbolize the nature of their call to go and to serve. So in looking at this theme of being anchored this fall, we've added a gold anchor to our altar as a symbol of the anchor we read about in Hebrews. Let us hear that part again. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become the high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He is the high priest forever. So this anchor is our symbol of hope as Christians. And the writer of Hebrews insists that the Christian possesses the greatest hope in the world, according to William Barclay. Now our scripture read today came from Hebrews 6 and chapter 11 and chapter 12. And upon hearing these they're the content and the sermon of faith, the people of faith and our response to faith. We read of both Abraham and those in that great cloud, that great crowd of witnesses as we run our race of faith. 
Abraham long desired a child, as did his wife Sarah, and for 25 years he waited. After he had left Ur, he was old, he was barren. The wandering was long, but Abraham never wavered from his hope and trust in the promise of God, writes Barclay. And this oath, a promise from God, comes as a result of patience that God would multiply, <coughs> that God would bless Abraham's family, like many, many grains of sand that we find at the seashore. And so as we read today in our scripture, we find the story of faith and hope in this anchor. Jesus is our anchor, which brings safety, a connection which is secure. Now, when teaching college courses on child development, I often use this anchor metaphor to explain about attachment theory as it relates to good parenting and to good teachers. So you're going to get a quick lesson on attachment theory today. And I would draw on the whiteboard a simple stick drawing of a sailboat, and I would add some little water, and then I would add a chain or a rope and draw an anchor. And then I would draw a huge circle from the anchor, not the boat, from the anchor, all the way around this drawing. Now this represents the child and a parent or a teacher. The anchor is the parent, the anchor is the teacher, and the boat is the child. And the child can go anywhere in that circle where it is firmly anchored and feel safe. Now good attachment and healthy relationships allow children to feel safe and secure no matter where they go as long as they're connected to that anchor. A child who is firmly attached, and that's a good thing, feels secure. Now a child who is not firmly attached sometimes has had that anchor, rope, or chain just cut. Or maybe it's just weak. It's a weak rope or a weak chain. These are not the kinds of attachments we want because we know that children in those relationships drift far. They don't, they don't stay near that anchor or they come back often to make sure the anchor is even still there. Neither of those are our desirable traits for attachment. And children who feel safe and secure know that when they can't see the anchor, it's still there. This is the same as our faith with Jesus as our anchor. When we're secure in our faith and in our hope in Jesus, we can choose to venture out knowing that Jesus is always there. He is firm and secure. He is connected. He doesn't move. This is the faith we read about in Hebrews, one where our hope is in Jesus, and this hope is present and also our future. Hope is our goal and the anchor for our very soul. It's the presence of God, and no matter the conditions of our waters, whether stormy or calm, we feel safety in the anchor of Jesus. Now, the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary shares, but prior to faith in God's faithfulness, and unless the church hears and says this, Faith can be urged upon the frustrated who, lacking a clear object of trust, are left to have faith in faith. And without a clear whom or what, faith becomes another exercise in self-help. Let the pulpit not cease saying that God is dependable, that God does not break promises, that God does not abandon like faith, hope is the primary ingredient of a life healthy and alive toward God. Jesus, as our anchor, brings strength, a connection which is firm. Now that great cloud of witnesses Cliff read about is written in Hebrews and gives us a powerful message of the knowledge of the people who help to provide that firm connection. Now, as a child, I wished for a banana seat bicycle. Do some of you remember those? 
At some point in my elementary years, my parents bought me the most wonderful bicycle with the most amazing banana seat. You just have to trust me. It was super cool. And everyone wanted one. I have two strong memories about learning to ride this bicycle. The first involved my dad. I have a vision, if I close my eyes, it's as clear as watching it on the TV. My mom is standing so pretty and smiling on our front grass. And my dad is standing next to me on the sidewalk and I get onto this banana seat bicycle with anticipation and he smiles. And he takes his strong hands and he puts one on the handle right next to mine. And on the back of those banana seats, there was another handle, oddly enough, a shiny silver spot, and he put his other hand there. And you know what came next, right? He said, hold on. And he began to run down the sidewalk next to me, and I was pedaling as fast as I could, and he held on. And at some point, he let go. And I realized I was doing it. I was riding the bicycle. So I came to a stop and I turned around and he said, you did it. You did it. But I did it with his strength. His arms were enveloping around mine. My second memory of this bicycle is with my good friend Beth. She lived behind us in kind of a tall and narrow house across our back alley. She was a year or two older than me, and she knew I'd been really working hard on this banana seat bicycle. And she decided one day she would climb on behind me. So she climbed on behind me and wrapped her arms around me and held on. And she said, start pedaling. And so I did. And at some point I realized her hands had lifted off, but yet her strength enveloped me. As it says in our scripture, that great cloud of witnesses, they watch over us. They envelop us with their strength. And through their strength, we find strength. Now I can remember those experiences just like it yesterday. They gave me confidence. It gave me hope that I could learn to ride this bicycle. This great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews watches over us. They are here today. Sometimes they are a church family. Sometimes they are those who've gone before us. In scripture, it says Jesus was the forerunner of the race, which means he went ahead of us to the goal. And Barclay tells us the goal is nothing less than the likeness of God. You see, I wanted to be able to ride that bicycle like Beth. I wanted to be able to ride that bicycle like Beth. My dad knew that I could. I wanted to be in their likeness. Now last week I shared at children's time about the coming school year and I gave you guys a Bible verse and I said I wanted you to focus on Jesus this coming year, that Jesus is your anchor. And then I invited the church family. Do you remember what we did? We prayed over our students. We lifted our hands. I repeated this again at God and Me this week, and some of you may not even know what God and Me is, but on Monday mornings I meet with our preschoolers and our pre-K students from Bright Beginnings and our school-agers this week. And I did the exact same thing. I invited them this year to focus on Jesus, to let Jesus be their anchor. And I invited them not only for me to raise my hands, but for them to raise their hands for each other to be a cloud of witnesses for each other. Now after we prayed, one little boy came up back up and he shared with me, he said, when you prayed over us with your hands out, it was like I could feel Jesus' hands on me. That's the anchor of faith we're talking about. That's the strength that we have with our cloud of witnesses. Now Jesus brings us stillness, doesn't he? He brings us stability to our soul and a connection that gives us focus and priority. Now, one of our witnesses as United Methodist is John Wesley. That name should sound familiar, doesn't it? I spent the last week reading some of his sermons and even some of his journal entries. 
In sermon number 74, called On the Church, or Of the Church, he calls us to be the church. Not be the building, but be the church. Be the people for each other, this cloud of witnesses. And in sermon number 95, I read with great interest as he expanded on what he called On the Education of Children. He had great thoughts on parenting and raising children of faith, and it's exactly what we still need today. I actually read part of these aloud yesterday in the car to my family. Our children, these children, are part of our family of faith. They need us to be their witnesses. Now, as I read further in his journals, he wrote quite specifically about his day-to-day life. He even documented his schedule every single day, exact days and times, specific entries like 5 a.m., prayer, 5.30, breakfast, 5.45, prayer, 7 o'clock, spiritual talk, 8.30, met with, and it went on all day, every day. There were hundreds of them. Y'all could come read them if you want to. But he spent many of those entries listed prayer and spiritual talk and visits with his church family, being that cloud of witness. And I even found an entry named Chocolate. I love that entry. It let me know John Wesley was just like us. He loved to pray and talk about Jesus, and he loved a little bit of chocolate. Now, I found these entries to be what I would consider to be his priorities. They were important enough that he actually wrote them down. His faith and hope is well documented and shared, and it's amazing to me that we can still read these today. I wonder, what would people read about us in a couple hundred years? What are our priorities? Our families? Our faith? Our cell phones? Our overcommitted schedules? Our faith walk? To whom are we anchored? Max Lucado shares in his writing, Find me in the midst of the maelstrom. Sometimes events whirl around you so quickly that they become a blur. Whisper my name, God's name, in recognition that I am still with you. Without skipping a beat in the activities that occupy you, you find strength and peace in praying my name. And later, when the happenings have run their course, you can talk with me more fully. Accept each day just as it comes to you. Do not waste your time and energy wishing for a different set of circumstances. Instead, trust me enough to yield to my design and purposes. Remember that nothing can separate you from my loving presence. You are mine. In this scripture, in Hebrews 6, did you catch the last part? He's our anchor, but he went behind the veil. Now in the ancient temple, there would have been a large curtain, a veil here. The holy of holies here the ordinary people out there. And one day, just one day of the whole year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies to intercede for you, the ordinary folk, one day of the year. And it was so terrifying, they would take off their shoes, and they wouldn't stay long because it was dangerous to get that close to God. Now, when Jesus died at the resurrection, do you remember? What happened to that veil? Show me with your hand. Torn from the top to the bottom. And it was separated forever so that you and me have access to the Holy of Holies. And not just on one day, but when? Every single day. Every single day, Jesus is the high priest. Jesus intercedes for me. He intercedes for you as your anchor in the holy of holies in God's presence. And now we forever 
have access, not just to step in there and tiptoe in there with our feet, but to take our whole lives, our whole bodies straight to Jesus in real and personal relationship. Now that kind of hope, that kind of hope is the basis of our faith and our trust in Jesus. I read an old book, older than me, not older than all of you, and in 1965, Jürgen Moltmann wrote a wonderful book about theology of hope, and it was translated from German. And I want to read to you this section. It's a little long, but I want you to hear what he says. It still applies today. Hope is nothing else than the expectation of those things which faith has believed to have been truly promised by God. Christian faith then means tuning in to the nearness of God in which Jesus lived and worked. For living amid the simple everyday things of today is, of course, living in the fullness of time and living in the nearness of God. To grasp the never returning moment, to be wholly one with oneself, wholly self possessed and on the mark, is what is meant by God. Holy, present, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, all of us, our whole body present with Jesus. It's in that kind of stillness that Jesus reaches deep as the anchor into your life, isn't it? Did you see the sunset the past few nights? Did you hear a still voice? Did you see the large yellow moon with the haze lingering over it? Did you see the fireworks as you drove along on the interstate? This nearness, this anchoring to Jesus is what brings us safety. It's what brings us strength. And it's what brings us stillness and stability of our very soul. This is the anchor we long for and hope for. And this is the anchor available to all. Every one of us who wants a closer relationship with God. Is this your anchor? Will you choose to be anchored to Jesus this week, this month, and in your life? Amen? Amen. Today is Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor, and it's not in our hymnal, but I will uh, help you lead through the song. It, it is a hymn, though. It's just not in one of our hymnals. Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor in the fury of the soul.
salvation ever faithful ever true we will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed let us continue in our worship with the giving of our tithes and of our offerings Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Something, or is it someone, stirs within us when we worship. We know there is a movement, imperceptible to the eye, soundless to the ear, that gathers up our talents and strength to prepare us for the days ahead. How precious is this place? How priceless your children. How beautiful and supportive is the news of hope, the certainty of love, and the inspiration of faith. Amen. As you go today, might you know God's hope and love for you. Might he be your anchor, no matter what the waters bring in the coming week. Might you know his love and presence. Go and serve him and love him in peace.